We're going to start things off this morning uh, with our keynote speaker uh, talking about China's metals and mining outlook. Uh, I'm delighted to welcome from uh, Shanghai Metals Markets uh, here in Singapore, uh, Ian Roper. So, Ian, please. Thanks, Leah. Cool. Thanks, Leah. Ooh. Okay, well, yeah, you can see from the, uh, the key to the title there, um, slowing the slowdown. I think that's uh, you know, just ch changing the view, really, in the last few weeks. Um, because we started the year a bit on the back foot, really. You know, we'd had a very strong fourth quarter last year. Um, a lot of money flowing into commodities. Prices did very well. And a lot of that was driven on Western world economic bullishness, right? PMIs, lead indicators, all very strong. And a lot of uh, consensus bearishness towards the US dollar. Um, so that is always a, a good thing for commodities. So we'd started the year thinking things look a little bit elevated. And clearly, there was a risk that China was going to slow this year. We saw that in the Davos speech. They outlined very clearly, you know, China is always inverse to the rest of the world from a macro perspective. If the global economy is weak, that's when China stimulates. If the global economy is strong, that's when they take their foot off the accelerator. They try and hold back some of the firepower for when they need it later. So there was a very clear message from the start of the year that they were going to cut infrastructure spending. You know, they cut 100 billion RMB off the rail budget. Um, grid spending budget only came in plus 3%, and a very clear message they would tighten credit. Now, that's what we felt straight after Chinese New Year. Now, coming out of Chinese New Year, January, February, lots of, lots of optimism, so especially in steel, we saw very high steel inventory into Chinese New Year. Coming out of Chinese New Year, credit conditions tightened noticeably, and that's why we saw a sell-off in steel, in iron ore, and to some degree in the base metals, but obviously base metals more recently driven more by ex-China political factors as much as fundamentals. Um, but that said, you know, 2Q has done very, very well. You know, so second quarter demand in China, everything we're seeing looks very strong. We run our own PMIs, so our steel PMI is at its highest level since October 2016. Now, underlying demand is very strong. Um, partly that's pent-up demand from winter. So the winter closures that we saw, um, in a way, that, that was kind of a, a disappointment to the commodity markets. People were getting excited through the end of last year. China was going to switch off lots of aluminium and steel capacity through the winter. Now, that happened, but they also switched off the demand. We had a blanket ban on construction activity across northern China through the four months of winter. So that's why 2Q's done well, because we're seeing a, a resurgence of that demand switching back on again. So yeah, we started um, at the the beginning of the year expecting a slowdown in China through the year, that as they tightened, things would get tougher in the second half. Now, with all the trade frictions that we've been seeing recently, they've clearly backed off. So that's why I'm saying they are slowing the slowdown. So I'm becoming more optimistic towards second half demand conditions, because through March, clear tightening in credit conditions. Since then, they've really backed off because they're worried about the potential implications of a trade war. So right now, looking into the second half, things actually look pretty solid here. Um, so, you know, the, the two key things, obviously housing and infrastructure, always massive drivers of, of commodity demand. Um, so on the infrastructure side of things, you know, we still see that slowing quite markedly. You know, rail infrastructure was down quite substantially in the first quarter. Grid spending was off 20%. We do think that will catch up, though. Um, that is responsible for a bit of weakness in copper. Um, but the housing market's the interesting one. Right. So last October in the Congress, you know, Xi Jinping said housing is for living, not for investment. That was his one macro comment that he made. And a lot of people took that as being bearish, right? Oh, no, we're going to have another clamp down on the property market. But actually, I think you know, he's been quite smart about this. He's looked at what's going on elsewhere in the world, right? No, the affordability rates everywhere are terrible. You can never bring property prices down, especially in China. The ownership rates are way too high and the economy is too reliant on housing. They have to keep the private market going. So what he's saying is he's essentially going to replicate the Singapore system of having a two-tier housing market, where if you can't afford it in the private market, the government will build it themselves. So they've had this shanty house redevelopment program, which, you know, in my mind, you think of shanty houses, you think of a kind of rat-infested, 100-year-old building. You know, in China, these are things that are 15 or 20 years old. They're basically saying, we've massively overbuilt. We've got too many empty apartments. So last year, the central government bought 6 million apartments 
and gave them away as free upgrades to people under this program. So the central government last year was 20% of housing sales. So this year they were supposed to slow that policy to 5 million units, but they got cold feet on that at the end of the year, raised it to 5.8 million units, because they know, you know this is going to hurt the market too much if they slow too quickly. So we've got this, this big um, policy of, which has helped the destocking of the central government buying lots of apartments. Obviously not sustainable in the long term, but for this year, that's going to keep things ticking over. And the private market, you know, pressure remains. They've kind of capped the price appreciation. Um, but developers have still seen very strong sales. They've got very strong balance sheets. They've bought a lot of land last year. And sales are still rising through the first quarter. Um, so we still think overall construction activity will be a positive this year in China. And with that backdrop, that's obviously very supportive for metals demand. So as I said before, you know, credit, that's a, a, always a key in China. You know, you tend to see a very strong uh, feed-through effect from credit conditions to metal prices because there's such a strong trading element to the economy. Um, so really, like I said, March, credit conditions were very tight, new lending disappointed. Um, and since April, we've had the triple R cut, shy balls come down, and the new lending data for April was very strong. So I think the fact that there's now more money flowing through the economy leaves us in a good shape for second half demand. So one, you know, a couple of key global macro influences that are, are kind of pulling commodities in opposite directions at the moment. Now oil and the dollar always have a massive impact on metal prices. Very well known, you know, very clear trends for, for, for many decades. Um, but at the moment we're seeing two very interesting kind of differentiation going on right now. So you know, I was saying at the start of the year we'd seen a lot of money flowing into commodities from an investment angle on the weak dollar thesis. There was generally a consensus view that the US dollar was going to keep weakening and that that could be a multi-year trend. Um, and I was saying, look, if we see a snapback rally in the dollar, then that could be very painful for commodities. Now, we've seen that in the last month or so, right? The dollar's rallied quite sharply. And it, with that backdrop, actually, that you know, metal prices have come off a little bit in the last month. But considering the moves in the dollar, I think they've actually done really well. Certainly things like copper, where you saw massive net length added. You know, we've seen a little bit of that length come off, but, but not too much. So you know, the, the dollar is certainly a, a headwind for metal prices at the moment. You know, we, they've done well, but if the dollar does keep strengthening, I do worry you'd see a lot of like the algos come in and start smashing copper to some degree. Um, but equally on the other side, oil. You know, commodities tend to move with oil as well. Now, I'd say oil is more of a coincident rather than a, a kind of leading um, indicator for, for metal prices. Um, but, you know, you do still, that does raise the cost curves. So, I mean, iron ore is the most sensitive. For every $10 a barrel in oil, that adds about $3 a ton to your marginal iron ore cost out of Brazil, because obviously the, the shipping being the bulk of that cost increase. So, this definitely is raising cost curves with oil back at highs not seen since 2014. But if we move on to the base metals, you know, kind of SMM's main coverage is on the, the base metals, new energy, uh, ferrous space. We don't do so much in energy, but, but I can talk to coal for a bit as well. Um, so aluminium, you know, there was a big disconnect last year between Western world views on aluminium and the Chinese view on aluminium. So there's three big supply side reforms. You know, this generic term supply side reform has been too widely used in China. So the only real supply side reform it was the steel. Right, where they've actually closed outdated capacity, the utilization's gone up, the profitability is there, and we're going to stay there. We've still got to go through the consolidation. The steel market is, is genuine supply-side reform. What we saw in coal was not supply-side reform. In fact, it was the antithesis of supply-side reform. Supply-side reform means close the small, outdated, inefficient firms and make the big ones stronger. In coal, too many of the small ones were going bust. That was causing too much pain in 2015. So they said, actually, we've got to close the big ones. We've got to get the big guys to cut production to keep the small guys in business because that's causing too much economic pain. So that's why we had the 276 policy. Now, that was driven, that was a financial bailout. It wasn't supply-side reform because the PBOC went to the NDRC and said, look, we have so many bonds and WMPs linked to coal mines which are going to default. This is going to be very ugly. You know, steel and aluminium, they're generally big SOE firms borrowing from big SOE banks. They're not a systemic financial risk. Whereas coal was very levered on the wealth management products and bonds, and that was going to cause a lot of pain. 
So that's why the government had to move on coal. They got the big guys to cut production, and that jumped the price up, and, that, and then they kind of went too far with the demand recovery, and since then they've been backpedaling. So yeah, coal was more of a financial bailout than supply side reform. Aluminium, you know, aluminium's another one which they called supply side reform, but realistically aluminium was politics, right? The, the former head of Chalco, Ya Xiaoqing, his good buddies with Xi Jinping, he got promoted two years ago to run SASAC, so he now runs all the SOEs in China. Now, Chalco was supposed to be China's flagship commodity company. They had the deals with Rio. They were supposed to, you know, be the lead, a lead commodity company in China. And they just kept getting killed by the private guys. Hong Chao and Xin Fa were just throwing in endless new low-cost capacity, bottom of the cost curve. And Chalco, 2015-16, was having to close all their smelters to fight off, you know, the losses caused by the, the smaller guys. So that was politics, because they said, look, Chalco is suffering. The private guys have just done too much to hurt it. So we're going to clamp down on the private guys and get rid of them. So that's why you had this whole supply side reform in aluminium, was really eliminate the competition for Chalco and improve Chalco's position. And that therefore means higher aluminium prices, because they're at the top of the cost curve. Um, so that's why we had this clamp down. Now, that all ended. People were excited with the winter cuts, that we were going to cut lots of aluminium capacity through winter. But actually, they resolved the politics before that, so it never happened. Um, so Hong Chao had the bailout by CITIC in November last year, so it's now a quasi-SOE. It's no longer persona non grata. And Xin Fa went through the closures, did everything they needed to do as well. So that's why we saw the deductions on the winter cuts. So all last year, aluminium was oversupplied. We were building aluminium inventory because people thought we'd lose so much capacity over winter that we'd see a big draw in inventory. But then we got these massive deductions. So the winter cuts only ended up being less than a million tons, when initially people thought they might be two and a half million tons. So instead of drawing inventory through winter, we actually built inventory to record highs. Aluminium has been horribly oversupplied in China. Um, so the aluminium fundamentals don't look good. Western world, people were saying, look, China's doing this supply side reform. They're closing smelters. So Western world's going to have to open new aluminium smelters to feed the demand. But that's not true. China is still adding another 4 million tons of smelters this year and up to 9 million tons in total. And that 4 million tons have all got licenses because they've bought the licenses off Chalco from the smelters that they closed years ago. So China is still horribly oversupplied for aluminium. Um, now, a lot of that capacity is sitting there, ready to go, but margins are just terrible at the moment. Like I said, inventory is at a record high. Aluminium is horribly oversupplied. So aluminium does not look good structurally on a kind of two-year view. There is far too much smelting capacity in China. Obviously, prices have been coming down for the raw materials. Like I say anodes have come off with after the, the winter closures, switching back on again. Um, and coal prices have come down as well. So last year, second half last year, everything went wrong for coal in China. We had the HSE clampdowns. We had the you know, winter gas shortages, so they needed more coal. But the big swing influence on coal prices was hydro. Hydro was really weak last year in China, and that added 100 million tons of additional thermal coal demand. That's why coal prices were so high. So this year, you know, through Chinese New Year, they told the mines, OK, you can't have holidays at Chinese New Year. You've got to keep working. That added about 50 million tons of additional coal supply. And they prioritized coal on the rail network. And that's been enough to bring coal prices back under control. But the key to watch really is still that um, the hydro this year. Hydro has still been weak in Q1. If hydro comes back strongly through the summer, coal prices will come under pressure in the second half. If hydro is weaker, then they may continue the, the, the bit of the bounce that we've seen now restocking into peak season. But of course, the hot topic in aluminium these days is alumina. Um, so we've obviously, Chinese alumina, as with aluminium, very oversupplied. We've got no shortage of capacity. Um, and with the cuts over winter, you know, we saw 1 million tons of alley smelters offline, but we saw 4.5 million tons of alumina refineries offline. And that's why the alumina market in China tightened. A lot of those ones that closed were the private ones as well. So Chalco had a near monopoly on the domestic alumina market. That's why they hiked the price into the winter closures in Q4 last year. So that supply was all coming back on. Prices were coming down. Then we had the uh, Alinorti issue. Then we had the Rusal issue. Suddenly, seaborne prices went crazy. So, so far, you know, the margins are very good for alumina in China. So we're seeing a lot of supply increasing. We've seen 120,000 tons of alumina re-exported from China as soon as the price spiked. You know, 
import shipments that arrived, they just reloaded them and sent them straight out. And we've seen about 200,000 tons of Chinese alumina being exported as well. So we reckon they can get up to 400,000 tons this quarter, potentially more next quarter if the prices stay, stay high. But you can see there the price, the ARB, has closed very, very quickly with that switch to exports. So the domestic alumina price is up. That's lifted the Chinese aluminium cost curve. But overall, you know, we think the marginal cost for Chinese smelters is about 14,800 RMB today. That's roughly where the SHFE price is. And there's just too much supply of aluminium, so we can't be bullish on that. Um, key things on, on alumina, of course, any clarity over when Alunorte comes back, you know, I think that that's, means that alumina will, will come off sharply. But until that happens, I think we just drift sideways from here. We see more Chinese exports, prices, you know, normalize and drift lower from the mid 500s down to the 400s. Um, but we really need clarity on Alunorte and Rosell. Um, that when that happens, then we could see prices coming off more sharply because fundamentally, China still has plentiful supply of alumina. Um, so yeah, aluminium's one which, which looks horribly oversupplied. Yeah, supply grew too quickly last year, well ahead of demand. We've got to do a bit of destocking this year. Um, so yeah, aluminium, after these new smelters are added, they won't build any more. You know, that's quite clear. Additions beyond this 9 million, very unlikely to happen, but we've got to digest that first. So aluminium looks horribly oversupplied on a two-year view, may have a great structural story on a five-year view, but for the next couple of years, um, there's just too much supply. And on the whole Rusal stuff, you know, the key thing to watch, if the Rusal sanctions do go ahead, China would become the main buyer of Rusal aluminium. Um, you know, if you remember through the Iranian sanctions, Iran was China's fourth largest supplier of iron ore. They have no issues operating in a non-dollar environment. Um, so it's very clear, you know, the Russian aluminium would flow into China, and then we'd need Chinese aluminium flowing into the world. So Chalco has been pushing very hard to remove the 15% export tax. That's obviously very much a political decision, but depending on how trade tensions go between the US and China, I think you know, that aluminium export tax would be quite high up the retaliatory list uh, from the Chinese perspective. So do watch out for any issues there. If we move on to something more positive, copper. Um, so you know, copper, like I say, it's done very well given the, the rally that we've seen in the dollar. Um, but fundamentally, you know, copper looks like a tail of, of two markets at the moment. You look at copper from a concentrates market, it looks extremely tight. Right? We saw the TCs settled at $82. Immediately, spot went down into the low 70s, and it stayed there. And the forward spot rates on, on TCs for Q4 are about $55 to $60. So China's adding 1.1 million tons of smelters this year, and they are worried about where they're going to get the concentrate supply. So at the start of the year, people are expecting a lot of disruptions to the mines. Um, we haven't seen that so much. Certainly, I think the feedback from Sesco Week in Chile was that you're not going to see so much disruption as perhaps previously expected. But still, you know, the, the cons market looks very tight. TC is staying very low. So that's a, a very much a positive for copper. And we all know the balance is going forward, you know, global mine supply going backwards in a couple of years. So copper still has the best structural outlook with a lack of supply. Um, but when we look at the refined side, Copper doesn't look so tight. You know, inventory, we saw the, the seasonal inventory build into Chinese New Year. We haven't seen much of a draw out of that. Physical premiums, they're not very high either. So refined copper supply does look pretty sufficient right now. Now, demand's not done well in the first quarter. Like I said, grid spending was down 20% year on year, and that's about half of China's copper consumption. So we think that will catch up through the year. Um, but right now, you know, there's a little bit too much inventory of copper around. We've seen a fair few deliveries into the LME recently as well. Um, so I do worry if you see dollar appreciation continuing for a few more weeks, if you see a few more inventory deliveries, I'd certainly worry that a lot of algos start to sell copper because they're, they're very much programmed against those two factors. We've still got quite a bit of net length in copper. So I think short-term worry that copper could come off, but fundamentally, that would be a great buying opportunity. You know, I still think copper has the best structural story of all of the major commodities on a three plus year view. Um, because yeah, globally mine supply going backwards in a couple of years, lack of investment in new mines, new mines all underground, higher cost, longer lead time. And on the demand side of things, copper is a late cycle metal. It's leveraged to consumers, electronics, appliances. And then as we discussed yesterday in the panel, you know, on the EV side of things, building out charging stations, EVs, that's that incremental copper demand. 
which can just keep us increasingly in deficit. So I think copper is a great structural story, but right now looks reasonably comfortably supplied. Now the scrap market's one we've seen a lot of a lot of talk about. Um, that you know, China's clamped down on the imports of, of a lot of low-grade scrap across a lot of commodities, um, basically because they're trying to clean up the environment. They don't want to deal with a lot of the dirty low-grade scrap. Now the issue with that is that we're not going to lose that scrap, right? A lot of people were like saying, "Ah, oh, China's banning Category Seven imports; they'll lose 300,000 tons of scrap." Well. Obviously, at these prices, that scrap's still profitable, so it's just moving around. We're seeing a lot of Chinese activity in Vietnam and Cambodia, a bit in the Philippines as well, of just diverting the shipments and process them there, and then take them into China as Category 6. So there's still too much margin in that. You know, the low-end processing, getting copper out of a motherboard or copper wires wrapped in rubber or plastic, that's a very basic processing. They just pile it up, set fire to it, the rubber and plastic burns off and you're left with the copper. It's very dirty, that's why China doesn't want to do it anymore. But you know, if you can still find a poor country that, that will do that processing, um, then that's where it's going to happen. So it's just more of a diversion on the copper scrap. We're not actually going to lose much of that supply at all. Um, so yeah, copper mine supply, yeah, doing a bit better this year. Um, disruption, not so much, but still concentrates. TC's very, very tight market. Um, but yeah, from, from 2019 onwards, we think copper really starts to tighten up. Um, so that's definitely the, the best structural market. Now, zinc's one which, you know, was at LME week last week in Hong Kong. Um, you know, zinc was the kind of favorite of the market last couple of years, but it's really faded into the background now. Um, not so much interest in zinc anymore. So I think there's a generally well-known story that, that we've been very short of, of concentrate supply since Glencore closed a few mines. Um, but there's about a million tons of cons due on stream over the next 18 months, now weighted to the back end of this year and next year. So at the start of the year, we were looking at the trajectory on that refined inventory draw. And the concern was, are we going to run out of refined zinc before the new mine supply arrives? So that's why people were bullish. You know, zinc's at 10-year highs, $3,300, $3,400. Now, a lot of people were, were trading that story. So actually, there was a lot of refined zinc inventory off exchange. So in the US, uh, but also in China, there was about 300,000 tons of refined zinc in bonded warehouses waiting to deliver into any price spike. And I think that material's just got cold feet. So we started off with that 77,000 ton delivery into New Orleans back in uh, March. And um, we've seen subsequent deliveries as well um, on LME. Um, and in China as well, some of the material's been coming out of the bonded warehouses into the visible market. So yeah, zinc, again, from the, the inventory levels, it still looks pretty tight in China. Um, TC's still extremely tight as well. Um, domestic mine production in China is, is a bit weaker as well. You know, that's a consistent theme we've seen since the second half last year. We had a big HSE clamp down in China. So that cut coal output, iron ore output, zinc, copper, bauxite, production of everything was impacted by those closures, and we're still suffering from that. Um, but yeah, people know the seaborne zinc cons are, are arriving imminently, um, so it looks like people are kind of giving up on the zinc trade. We also worry about pricing above $3,000 a ton. Is demand destructive? You see zinc losing out in, uh, certainly to alloys. You see a lot of substitution going on. You speak to steel mills, you know, Gal Steel is their lowest margin product. Um, so yeah, we think zinc it's probably past its best now. Um, but that said, when the supply arrives, it's only moving us from a deficit to a balanced market. It's not like aluminium or nickel, which I'll come on to, which we think has got clear oversupply. Um, you know, zinc is still going to be a balanced market, so prices staying in the high 2000s looks reasonable for now. So yeah, you will see a big pickup in concentrate imports through the second half of the year, and that's when the, the TCs will start to soften. So let's move on to nickel. That's my favorite kind of controversial subject at the moment. I mean, you know, nickel for the last eight years, if you track the marginal nickel pig iron cost in China with the LME refined nickel price, that was what was setting the price, right? For the last eight years, it's been very clear. If you understood MPI, you could predict the, uh, the LME nickel price, very straightforward. Since LME week last, last November, you know, that was like the first time anyone had heard of electric vehicles or something, because suddenly, the money started flowing into nickel. LME nickel prices just, just disconnected from the MPI story and, and, and went up and up and up. 
Um, but you know, having followed the nickel market for so many years and looking at the MPI development in China, there is no fundamental shortage of nickel units. It's just the wrong type of nickel at the moment. But there is a feedback loop, and that's the thing I'm very concerned about. Um, so, yeah, MPI margins are ridiculously strong right now, 30% plus margins. In March, I went up to uh, was traveling around China in Shandong, Linyi City. It's the biggest MPI producer in China. They have 25 furnaces. They're building another eight. They make 100,000 tons a year of MPI. That's about 5% of global nickel production um, from that one plant. And they said, look, margins are huge. We're just flat out here. Um, so the problem for MPI in recent years has been the nickel ore supply, but obviously Indonesia has now handed out 32 million tons of nickel ore export licenses, and the material has started moving. So MPI output in um, April was up 33% year on year in China. Um, stainless steel margins are terrible. So the stainless guys are suffering. The MPI guys are making a fortune and raising output. That is not a good recipe for the nickel market. Um, so yeah, we think MPI production this year, we were expecting it to grow 150 plus thousand tons. You know, we're already annualizing that near that level now. So I reckon MPI output could be up 170, 180,000 tons. There's no shortage of the ore right now. The Indonesian ore is flowing. Um, the port inventory is, is, is on the up again. Nickel ore price is coming under pressure. So there is a feedback loop on the whole stainless steel side of things, right? So right now, batteries consume about 60, 70,000 tons of nickel globally. Stainless steel consumes about one and a half million tons. So you know, the Chinese stainless mills are increasing their MPI usage. That means fundamentally they will be using less refined nickel. So that should mean we see a drop in China's refined nickel imports, freeing up more refined nickel to flow into the LME. And that's probably when you will see nickel prices coming under pressure. Because the bulls are still pointing to this downward trend in deliverable nickel, right? So you've got the MPI story, that's not LME deliverable, and then you've got the tier one nickel, briquettes and refined nickel. And that's where you know, we've been continually drawing inventory. And the problem for nickel now, so you look at China, yes, there's a horrible oversupply coming from MPI, but ex-China, you know, stainless margins are very good, stainless production is very strong, and refined nickel output ex-China last year um, in Q1 was the lowest in three years. So the refined nickel output's been struggling. You're seeing a few people trying to switch to sulfate, so they're offline at the moment as well. So nickel's a tale of two markets. You've got Western world, you've got tier one nickel. does look very tight. I can appreciate the story and why it's done well. But fundamentally, China's churning out more and more of this MPI. The Indonesian ores just started flowing after rainy season. Indonesian stainless is ramping up. Singshan's built this two million ton stainless mill, going to three million, planning to build another two million. Um, so, you know, the European stainless guys are saying, ah, protectionism will be okay, you know, we've got duties on cold rolled, we can do other stuff, but fundamentally, you know, if the China's got such a massive cost advantage. Indonesian nickel, nickel equivalent cost on MPI is seven to eight thousand dollars a ton. China's cost is eleven to twelve, and LME nickel's trading above fourteen thousand. So you've got a lot of potential downside there if, if LME nickel refocuses on the uh, MPI story as the marginal unit of nickel supply. So I love the EV story structurally. You know, in the 2020s, it'll, it, it can be very strong, but just near term, these high nickel prices are incentivizing a huge increase in MPI output, and ultimately, I think that will hurt nickel at some point this year. So yeah, I think we, we discussed EVs on the panel yesterday about you know, policy. Policy is very um, important. You know, China's still very much pushing EVs. I think they, they can be one of the leaders in the world. Um, you, know, you can take these slides. Um, Leo's got the slides. Happy to circulate them if you want to look through in more detail. Um, so like we were saying yesterday, you know, lithium prices ha have come off. They have recovered a bit recently. But we do think the growth in lithium processing in China, we've seen a huge increment in that through the second half of last year. So there's a fair bit of supply around now. That tightness has eased up. So lithium price is coming off a bit. Um, whereas cobalt's the one which still looks extremely tight. That would still be our kind of five favorite play out of the, the two of them. Um, and if we just move on to the, to the bulks for a little bit, iron ore is always kind of my, my uh, kind of focus over, over the recent decades. And it's been an interesting switch, right? You know, as a fundamental commodity analyst, looking at demand and supply models, 
Last year was a real frustration, right? Demand and supply of iron ore had no influence on the price whatsoever. It was all about Chinese emissions and steel mill pro profitability. You have to remember 60% of SOE steel mills in China, or 60% of steel production comes from SOE mills, right? SOEs are not profit maximizers. If you're the boss of an SOE in China, you've got your objective list from SASAC. Number one, make lots of money, pay lots of tax, pay all the workers. But they were exceeding that goal massively last year. And they were, no one was phoning them up saying, you need to make more money. Whereas the thing they were worried about was the emissions. If I screw up on the emissions, if I exceed the targets, I'm going to get fired. So that was essentially the issue for iron ore last year. Iron ore was massively oversupplied on paper. But the steel mills were making so much money and so obsessed with the emissions that they were telling the procurement guys, pay whatever it takes to get me the best raw material because we've really got to make you know, maximize the productivity and minimize the emissions. So that's why iron ore prices were really, really high, even though fundamentally there was no shortage. It was just the wrong type of iron ore. So yeah, last year pig iron output was pretty flat, um, but imports of iron ore were up 55 million tons. Domestic production was up 25 million tons. We had about 80 million tons oversupply of iron ore and paper, but the price did really well. Now this year, like I said, steel's done very well in the second quarter. We've seen a good bounce in steel prices. Steel margin's doing very well. And iron ore has not followed. Now, from a fundamental basis, iron ore today looks the best it has done in the last 18 months. We started the year expecting about 30% supply growth, a uh, 30 million ton supply growth in iron ore. But we've lost Minas Rio for the year. IOC is on strike. That's going to lose at least 5 million tons. BHP downgraded 5 million tons. The go and export ban has stopped exports from there. And the low prices, now the cost curve is working. We've seen cliffs, Atlas, West African, Indian material disappearing from the market. So I think this year, you know, iron ore imports will be down year on year. Seaborne iron ore supply will decline this year for the first time in many decades. That's bad news for the shipping industry. Um, but you know, fundamentally, we've got less supply on iron ore. We've got a very strong steel market. The iron ore price should be doing very well. But it, but it isn't right now. Um, so I'd say at the moment, you know, I think iron ore is overdue a catch-up rally, given the strength in steel. So I think on a three-month view, iron ore looks quite good here. And one of the issues is that we are losing the elasticity in the domestic iron ore. So you know, domestic iron ore has always been phenomenally price elastic. Small private mines, very little access to capital. If there's a margin, they produce. If they lose money, they close. That's always been the way in iron ore. But since the like, second half last year, we've seen this HSE clamp down in China and the mining output has really been impacted. So even though on paper, margins are very good, um, some of that mines are not operating. Right? We've seen a blanket ban on open pit mining in Herbei for the last six months. Um, so a lot of mines are investing in going underground. Um, so you will see an increasing volume of Chinese iron ore coming from underground. Um, that's higher grade, so actually the operating cost isn't so much of an increment, but there is a capex involved in uh, getting those mines online. But yeah, fundamentally, domestic iron ore supply struggling a bit. Steel demand doing very well at the moment. Like I said, our PMI extremely high right now. The draw in inventory, you know, out of Chinese New Year, credit tightening, people were worried that Chinese steel inventory was too high. We've got too much steel. Prices came off a lot. Now, that draw on inventory has been the sharpest pace we've seen in the last 10 years. So I think in a few more weeks, people will start worrying that China's running out of steel again, and then steel prices can actually spike higher. So I think steel and iron ore are probably my favorite commodity on a, on a three-month view here. I think that they look very, very strong right now. Um, so yeah, steel prices have bounced, margins are recovering. So yeah, steel and iron ore, the favorite place to be. But fundamentally, you know, structurally, iron ore is still the worst of all the commodities. So, and that's because of the scrap story. So I don't have a great deal of time left, so I'll go through quick. But basically, China's consumed about 10 billion tons of steel in the last 20 years. Last year, they only generated 80 million tons of obsolete scrap from that 10 billion ton pool. Now, if you look at Japan and Korea, Taiwan, they got about 25 to 33% of the steel consumption reappeared as scrap with a 15-year time lag. So China's steel consumption was growing very strongly in the early 2000s. We're now at that inflection point where the scrap is starting to grow quickly. And Beijing's jumped on this because you know, scrap-based steel making, the emissions are substantially less. I don't have coke ovens. I don't have sinter plants. So this is great. Let's build as many EAFs as we can and really push the scrap industry hard. 
So that's what you're seeing in China at the moment. So we've got 50 million tons of, of EAFs under construction. At the moment, the lead time on that equipment is over two years now. These guys are so busy. Um, and all of this is replacement capacity. This is the next leg of supply side reform. So first leg, we've closed the outdated 150 million tons plus the induction furnaces. Next leg, because of the winter cuts, instead of closing stuff in Tangshan for four months a year, let's actually move it. We'll close it permanently and build a new, cleaner electric arc furnace elsewhere in the country. So that's the focus in the steel industry at the moment, moving the capacity and upgrading it and switching it to EAFs. So that's, that's structurally you know, a massive headwind for iron ore. Fundamentally, Chinese steel demand plateauing with the demographics, with the slowdown in infrastructure and housing. You will see Chinese steel demand gradually softening over coming years. With a rising scrap generation, of course, that's going to displace iron ore consumption. So fundamentally, I think we saw peak iron ore supply last year on the seaboard market, and that will be a market in terminal decline from here on. So yeah, iron ore looks good on a three to six month view, but it's still structurally the worst of all the commodities. And on that um, rather pessimistic um, outlook, I'll uh, open the floor for questions there. Um, so I think we've got five minutes or so. Do you want to moderate? Uh, Rarus isn't something that I personally look at. Um, so we do publish a quarterly outlook on the Rarus, but personally I'm not across any of that, I'm afraid. Thanks, that's a great presentation. Um, well done. Um, just on your last comment on iron ore, the differentiation in different types of ore, it, is that, I mean, you've talked at some, I know mm. time, time is precious, but you know, we, we've seen it in nickel, the difference between the MPI and the sulphide, and you've, you've articulated well a view there. Um, w when you analyze the iron ore market from a supply side, yeah. are you, um, are you surprised with the premiums, the differential that's blown out for the low quality versus the high, or do you think they're sustainable over a longer term, or do you think, you know, that it's just an aberration in the market, or? Yeah, yeah, thanks. Because I hear what you're saying about tons, but. Yeah, yeah. Okay. yeah. Sure. yeah so I mean, we saw those differentials, the, the low grade discount, high grade premium was at like 40% um, back in October, November last year. Now that's because of winter, right? They, those winter closures, then in through mid-November to mid-March in China. So like I say, the Chinese steel mills, profits were really, really high. I'm being told I've got to cut, close a couple of furnaces, so I'm gonna run those other furnaces flat out. And I also have to minimize the emissions or I will get shut down. So they're essentially taking all of that excess profitability and saying, I will spend that on getting the best raw materials. So that's why also on scrap, for the first time in China, I think AK Steel's done this in the US, but no one else does this in the world, that they were actually taking scrap and grinding it into dust and putting it in the blast furnace with the iron ore. So instead of just putting it in the converter, putting it directly in the blast furnace. So their scrap consumption was over 30%. Um, and the productivity rates were like 20% higher than they'd, they'd got out of those furnaces previously. Um, so yeah, last year it was a case of I will spend anything to get high grade, especially direct charge like pellets. Now, it's been interesting these last couple of months because we've lost Minas Rio and IOC are both offline and they are two of very few high grade suppliers. Now, if you'd have lost them in September, October last year, I can imagine the impact on the price would have been through the roof. Um, but the market's done nothing, right? So those low-grade premiums and discounts have come in a bit from the extremes to about 30% right now. Um, and it feels a little bit like out of winter, that environmental pressure is just a little bit less. The mills are referencing the VIU a bit more. You know, they're not so willing to chase things. Um, so I think certainly environmental pressure will still be there. So we won't go back to the normal spreads of, say, 10 15%. Um, so we're at 30% today, premiums and discounts. So I think we probably stay in that 20 to 30 range. Um, but no, it's interesting how FMG is now selling low-grade iron ore to India, the home of low-grade iron ore, because Indian steel mills are profit maximizers. They're looking at the VIU going, hey, this stuff is so cheap. Yeah, I produce less and I have higher emissions. So I don't care about that. I care about the bottom line. So that's why I'll buy low-grade iron ore. Um, so yeah, we'll stay at extreme levels on the VIU, but equally we're not going to go too far beyond that economics on the VIU, I think. Any other questions? Any thoughts on uranium? 
And it's not something we look at, I'm afraid. No, so. John, John would like me to say something bullish, but uh. <laughs> speak to speak to John about that. Um, yeah. Well, thank you very much. I think that's uh, that's we're out of time now. But uh, as usual, great presentation there from Ian Rope. Can a round of applause, please, Thanks for us.